Hi there, um, I'm Angus Kirk, uh, this is Freddie Bowles, we've got Dominic James and Calvin Willis. Uh, we're from Kevy TV, um, it's such a privilege to be here and last year we actually got the opportunity to speak with, to interview Sugar Mitra about his project, uh, the, the Hole in the Wall project um, and it was a great opportunity not just for our development but for, for the development of the whole school. Hi, I'm Freddie, and uh, Professor Mitra and Ted have really inspired us at Kevy. Um, we're in the middle of launching our own Ted Ed Club at the school, which we are really keen to take far. Uh, we maintain links with uh, and Skype meetings with Ted in New York to try and develop the curriculum of our Ted Ed Club, which we hope will go so far because we're really excited about it. Hi, I'm Dom. As I already says, the meeting for hard it's developed hugely since over the last few weeks, and we are really excited about it. Kevy wants to be the catalyst to help students develop their skills, not just only on a local scale, but now on a global scale. scale sorry. And so we are really excited about the next up and coming weeks where we can talk to people around the world. Calvin's going to talk about our time at the, at the university. So after interviewing Professor Mitra, next came the process of editing our 60 minute long video down to the clip you're just about to see. We did this with the help of Gareth Hudson, who is here at Newcastle University. Um, we were really excited to work with him, one, because of his professional ability, and two, because we actually might have had a day off school. Um, <laughs> so the skills that he taught us were really valuable to us as Kevy TV and to produce this video. This allows us to um, pass these skills down to the younger members of Kevy TV so they can co continue on in the future. Um, thanks for listening to us, and we hope you enjoy the video. Hello, welcome to a special episode of Kevy TV. We're joined today by Professor Sagata Mitra. Welcome to Kevy, welcome Thank to Morpeth. The hole in the wall experiment, what was that all about? Well, it was just an experiment and it was to see if children can uh, learn to use computers by themselves, which of course we know the answer to now, but we didn't know then. It was uh, mostly in rural uh, areas in India and in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, in a few instances in, in slum areas. Mm -hmm. There was a very specific reason for doing that. I was testing for two things. One was an engineering uh, question, which is, will computers survive out in the open? Um, and what sort of problems will they have in different environments? So I chose uh, places which were very cold, very hot, very dusty, very humid, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and within each area, then I looked for those children who uh, would not have any source of information about computers mm -hmm. other than the hole in the wall computer because otherwise the experiment would not be pure. Mm -hmm. um, well, what was your actual inspiration for the project, the, the hole in the wall? There was no inspiration. Actually, a lot of people ask me this. So I wish I could say that, you know, one day a bolt of lightning struck me and, and I. Uh, and I got highly inspired to find this out. It was nothing of the sort. It was just curiosity and a bit of irritation about the fact that disadvantaged children don't have access to computers um, just because they ha happen to not have money. So then I thought, well, there must be a way that technology can sort that problem out. And uh, increasingly I found that, yes, you can possibly level the playing field if you changed your whole approach to how uh, learning should happen. What um, did you um, expect the outcomes uh, to be? And, uh, at that time, people used to think, well, they'll probably just break the computer or steal it or, uh, you know, or not, able, not be able to understand anything of, of how to use it mm -hmm. um, or lose interest in it. Um, uh, they wouldn't know any English, so they wouldn't be able to read anything of it, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. During the experiment, was it actually quite um, hard for the children to get to grips with there being just a computer planted in their village? Is it? Um, no, they, they were absolutely thrilled to have a computer planted inside their yeah. village. What they were disappointed with, and, and that's the sad part of the story which uh, remains mostly untold, is what happened when the computer went away. 
-hmm. and went away, it did. And I again have a statement from one of the children of those villages who's now grown up saying, you know, I had the advantage of having that computer in the wall, but the children after me didn't. Mm -hmm. Were there any major surprises that arise from doing the experiment? Yeah, almost every day was a surprise because, I mean, just to give an example, uh, in the original experiment there was no keypad, mm -hmm. keyboard. Yeah. And one day I found that it's open on Microsoft Word and it's got a child's name in it and it says hello or something like that. So I said, how on earth are they typing? They don't have a, a keyboard there. And uh, so I called one of the children and he said, no, there is a way to do it. Uh, and this is old, you know, word 1.0 or something. Uh, what he showed me was that there's something called a character map under one of the tools. If you go to the character map, you can actually point at characters and get those characters up on the screen. Mm -hmm. And then he figured out that you can change the font and you can change the color, so you knew how to make big colorful letters on the screen. And that's what he had done. And how did it actually change the lives of the children that were involved? Well, it's not, hard, it's not very easy to, to figure that out because uh, after the experiment was over in 2005, I didn't have the funding left to, to follow through on these children. Mm -hmm. But I did bump into anecdotal evidence of what happened to them. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, th it's quite strange. W one of the, I know that one of the children from one of the Hole in the Wall uh, experimental sites is at the moment doing a... PhD in uh, evolutionary biology in uh, Yale, uh, Connecticut. Uh, I know another student from a slum in an Indian city who is uh, studying medicine in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I, uh, an independent f uh, filmmaker interviewed a girl from one of the Delhi slums uh, who said, uh, I'm studying to be a teacher. And so she said, uh, did that computer have anything to do with it? And she said, yeah, it had everything to do with it because if it hadn't been there, I would have got. I would have been married with three children by now. She was 18 or something at that time. Mm -hmm. If it made one child uh, into someone who discovers a medicine that will make one of us live a little longer, then uh, it was probably worth it. Um, you've been working with the school in Gateshead um, and other um, things in the northeast. Um, how have you tried to implement your strategy into their schools? Well, you know, if you take the key findings from Hole in the Wall, it has two uh, very interesting properties. One is that there are no adults present. There is no supervision at all. Uh, the second is that the children are necessarily in groups because, you know, there are lots of children and there's one single computer. So, so then when I came to England um, and I got this opportunity to work with some schools, I thought, why not recreate that environment inside the classroom? You can't obviously do hole in the wall in, uh, in its original form in England because you would get a lot of uh, frozen children, but uh, I had to bring it indoors. So, uh, so how do you bring it indoors? It's very simple. You, uh, you put a few computers and you put, take lots of children into a room um, and you go away. That's about it. What has to happen is the hole in the wall inside the classroom. If you think that, no, if I just left them, uh, there will be no educational outcome at all. Um, that's not right. That's not correct. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you did ask them to find an answer to some question, uh, then you often find, as a teacher, that a lot of your work uh, just got done by itself. So what does the um, future hold for uh, learning uh, for children? Um, well, it's a big question uh, and the future at this point is highly unpredictable. But I think we can, we can look for some common threads in the whole thing. And um, one of those threads is, a, is an interesting possibility that knowing things may not be as important um, as they were in an earlier age. Uh, why was it important to know things earlier is because if you knew things, then sometimes in life you can use that knowledge to solve problems. But in today's world, you could counter that argument by saying, what if I, I approach life without knowing anything, 
and when I have a problem, I will ask the internet and find out how to solve it. In other words, knowing becomes on demand. Uh, school is not that way. Knowing is not on demand in school. The school tells you what you need to know. So that could be a huge shift in how schooling happens in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, Arthur C. Clarke, when I met him, what he said was, a teacher that can be replaced by a machine should be. Well, that's, a, that's a very tricky sentence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, And I think uh, you, you would uh, find that it's very hard to disagree with. Mm -hmm. The question is that, are you the kind of teacher who cannot be replaced by a computer, in which case we are happy with you, but if you can be, then what Clark says is, well, then you should be. Mm -hmm. Was it the Hole in the Wall project where you mentioned uh, Skype grannies? Yes. Yes. Can you explain more about that? Well, you know, Skype uh, gives us the, the possibility to, uh, uh, to speak to people, to video conference with people for free. So, so it's kind of obvious in retrospect that it should be used for education. Um, who will educate whom? Well, uh, we know that children can educate each other, so perhaps Skype can be used for that. But I thought of a, another approach, which is that we have a whole lot of highly experienced uh, school teachers. We have a lot of people who uh, are good with and uh, interested in children. So what would happen if I made a collection of these people mm -hmm. and said to them, look, will you go and talk to children for free once in a while, let's say uh, one hour a week. Yeah. And when you f phrase it that way, what I found in England here was that you literally have hundreds and hundreds of people who are perfectly willing to do that. Yeah. So I started to experiment and, and that whole group of people got called the granny cloud. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you had to give a, a lasting statement to English schools, um, what would it actually be? Well, not just English schools, I think to schools in general. Yeah. Um, nothing very dramatic, I would say, uh, get ready for change. Um, and so what, what, what sort of changes would you want in the schools? Would you want more technology in, implemented in the schools? Or? No, technology is just a, uh, just a means. So it's not a question of how much technology. Mm -hmm. as much as you need. But uh, what is it that we need to know or need to learn mm -hmm. for how long? Mm -hmm. Those are questions that you, we will need to assess. You know, there's a built-in assumption that you, you start when you're born, uh, for the first three years you have a jolly good time, then after that you go to school suddenly one day, and then you remain in school until age 18, and then suddenly school's over and you're out there in the, in, the, in the world. So who has decided that this is how it has to be, that it has to be a box like that, age 4 to age 18 and over? Uh, is there another model? Is it possible that you go to school from the moment you're born? Because we know that one-year-olds can handle iPads, so presumably they can. Maybe school can be at home. Maybe school looks different, whatever. Maybe schooling for the one to five year olds is for one hour a day. For five to 15 years, it's five hours a day. For 16 to 18 years, it's three hours a day. And for 18 to the end of your life, maybe it's one day a month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a sort of tapering school that goes through life. I think I would find it quite interesting to go back to school one day a month to get back that old feeling of you know the playing fields and all that all that stuff just for a day a month and if I had a question or a problem I know that school is still there so uh, we need to to re-examine each each one of these uh, one at mm -hmm. a time. At the TED conferences you mentioned the, uh, the school in the cloud could you um, expand on that? Yeah well uh, if you look at it in sequence, as I said, the hole in the wall sort of leads into the self-organized learning environment, which happened right here uh, in this part of England. Yeah. Uh, where does the self-organized learning environment go next? Mm -hmm. So it kind of brings together the granny cloud, the self-organized learning environment, the hole in the wall. Um, 
bits of what we learned technologically about how to keep this place running. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a school which produces a new kind of learning and it does so on autopilot. Mm -hmm. Just to finish off, um, what's the long-term target for yourself and your experiment? Well, assuming I stay out of hospital, um, what I would try to do in the next 10 years is to firstly see um, what comes after the school in the cloud. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that we need to look at a phenomenon called dematerialization. Mm -hmm. uh, dematerialization is pretty much simple to understand. I mean, if you take um, if you take something like a, uh, a tape recorder um, and then it shrinks and becomes a Walkman and it shrinks and becomes an MP3 player and then it just vanishes because, you know, it's up there on the internet, it's zeros and ones on the internet. Any device that can connect to the internet can play all your music, all your videos and everything. So it just dematerialized, an actual piece of technology dematerialized, vanished. Look at the fountain pen. The fountain pen was a beautiful object and you had to put ink into it and you had to have beautiful handwriting and everything. And then it changed and it became a cheap little piece of plastic, which was the ballpoint pen. Uh, except, and, and people, I remember there was a controversy about, oh, the ballpoint pen will produce very poor quality handwriting, not half as good as ink. And, uh, which it did, it, it, it I think reduced the quality of handwriting everywhere. But it had another property, which is that everyone could have one or more of them. It was cheap enough. So we traded off and we said, okay, the fountain pen's gone, the ballpoint pen's in. And then the ballpoint pen, at this point in time, it's well on the way to dematerializing. We type everything. And it looks as though we are typing on paper with ink, but we're not. We're just generating strings of zeros and ones somewhere up there. So we have effectively dematerialized writing. Mm -hmm. So, if this trend towards dematerialization continues, mm -hmm. and if I had to make an absolutely wild guess, I would say we are probably looking at a world where institutions will dematerialize. Right. And schools may be one of them.